Good morning, Tea with Miss P, day four. Don't mind my crazy hair. I just got out of the shower. I woke up a little late today. It's weird not having to set an alarm and wake up so early to get to school. So I've been sleeping in just a little bit to catch up. So yesterday, I told you I was going to doodle, and I did that. I did some doodling on my phone, because you guys know I have that pen on my phone that makes it easier to draw and write. But then I also found some paper in my house and drew on a piece of paper, and I followed the Mo Willems um, doodle at lunchtime, and I drew my very own pigeon. I think it looks pretty good for my, for my first try. And it says that I miss you. That's probably backwards to you guys. But I do miss you. That's what my pigeon's thinking because that's how I'm feeling. I wanted to show you. I'll probably hang this up because I think it looks really good. He's a little big in the front. But maybe next time I can do it a little different so it looks uh, so that he can have a friend. Today what I think I'm going to do is I think I'm going to call some friends. I've written letters to friends. I've cleaned my whole house. I've now doodled a little bit. I think today I'm going to call some friends and see how they're doing because I feel a little lonely sometimes because I live by myself here. But maybe if I call some friends, I'll feel a little less lonely because I get to talk to them. I think I also might bake some cookies because mm, I love me some cookies. So I'll see how that goes. We'll see if I have the ingredients for it. I should at least have ingredients for chocolate chip cookies, but I really want to make chocolate crinkle cookies because those are some of my favorite cookies. They taste like little brownies. They're so delicious. But I'll have to see if I have all the ingredients for that. Let's get back to our book for the day. So we last left Matilda and she was feeling very angry and very upset and she was plotting something else she can do to her parents, well, her dad, because he was very mean to her. Do you guys remember that they were like, her dad, her brother, and Matilda were all sitting in the living room and Matilda's dad came in and said, son, I want you to add all these numbers and tell me how much money I made today. Matilda did that all in her head and got the correct answer. But Mr. Wormwood didn't believe it. He thought she was cheating and lying. But really, she can just do math in her head. So he was yelling at her saying girls can't do math and how you shouldn't be doing this. So she was plotting up something, something for him. So wonder what that'll be. Last time she taught her dad a lesson, it was with the ghost. Wonder if she'll do something else with the parrot or if she'll try something completely different. Let's keep reading. This chapter is called The Platinum Blonde Man. There is no doubt in Matilda's mind that this latest display of foulness by her father deserved severe punishment. And she sat eating her awful fried fish and fried chip, ignoring the television. Her brain went to work on various possibilities. By the time she went up to bed, her mind was made up. The next morning, she got up early and went into the bathroom and locked the door. As we already know, Mrs. Wormwood's hair was dyed a brilliant platinum blonde, very much the same glistening silvery color as a female tightrope walker's tights at a circus. The big dyeing job was done twice a year at the hairdressers, but every month or so in between, Mrs. Wormwood would use, would use to freshen up, would give a rinse in the wash basin with something called platinum blonde, extra, platinum blonde hair dye extra strong. This also served to dye the nasty brown hairs that kept growing from the roots underneath. The bottle of Platinum Blonde Hair Dye Extra Strong was kept in the cupboard in the bathroom, and underneath the title on the label were written the words, Caution, this is peroxide, keep away from children. Matilda had read it many times with fascination. Matilda's father had a fine crop of black hair, which he parted in the middle, of which he was exceedingly proud. Good, strong hair, he said fond of saying, means that there's good, strong grain underneath. Like Shakespeare, Matilda once said to him. Like who? Shakespeare, Daddy. Was he brainy? Very, Daddy. He had masses of hair, didn't he? He was bald, Daddy. To which the father snapped, If you can't talk sense, then shut up. There he is, combing his brilliant black hair. Anyway, Mr. Wormwood kept his hair looking bright and strong, or so he thought, by rubbing it every morning with large quantities of a lotion called Oil of Violet's Hair Tonic. A bottle of this smelly purple mixture always stood on the shelf above the sink in the bathroom alongside the toothbrushes. 
and a very vigorous scalp massage with the oil of violets took place daily after shaving was completed. This hair and scalp massage was always accompanied by a loud, musculine grunts and heavy breathing and gasps of, ah, that's better, that's the stuff, rub it right in the roots, which could be clearly heard by Matilda in her bedroom across the hallway. Now, in the early morning privacy of the bathroom, Matilda unscrewed the cap of her father, Oil of Violets, and tipped three quarters of the contents down the drain. She then filled up the bottle with her mother's platinum blonde hair dye extra strong. She carefully left enough of her father's original tonic in the bottle so that when she gave a good strong shake, the whole thing still looked reasonably purple. She then replaced the bottle on the shelf above the sink, taking care to put her mother's bottle back in the cupboard. So far, so good. At breakfast time, Matilda sat quietly at the dining room, eating her cornflakes. Her brother sat opposite her with the back to the door, devouring hunks of bread, smothering with a mixture of peanut butter and strawberry jam. The mother was just out of sight around the corner in the kitchen, making Mr. Wormwood's breakfast, which always had to be two fried eggs on fried bread with three pork sausages and three strips of bacon and some fried tomatoes. At this point, Mr. Wormwood came noisily into the room. He was incapable of entering any room quietly, especially at breakfast time. He always had to make his appearance felt immediately by creating a lot of noise and clatter. One could almost hear him say, I'm here, it's me. It's the great man himself, the master of the house, the wage earner, the one who makes it possible for all of you to rest and live so well. Notice me, pay your respects. There is Mr. Wormwood every morning massaging his head with his uh, oil that he puts in his hair to keep it so thick. On this occasion, he strode in and slapped his head, slapped his son on the back and said, Well, my boy, your father feels he's got for another great money-making day at the garage. I have a few little beauties. I'm going to flog to these idiots this morning. Where's my breakfast? It's coming, treasure, Mrs. Wormwood called from the in the kitchen. Matilda kept her face bent down low over her cornflakes. She didn't dare look up. In the first place, she wasn't sure at all of what she was going to see. And secondly, if she did see what she thought she was going to see, she couldn't trust herself to keep a straight face. The son was looking directly ahead out the window, stuffing himself with bread and peanut butter and strawberry jam. The father was just moving around to sit at the head of the table when the mother came sweeping out of the kitchen carrying a huge plate piled high with eggs, sausages, bacon, and tomatoes. She looked up. She caught a sight of her husband, and she stopped dead. She let out a scream, and it seemed to lift her right out of the air. She dropped the plate with a crash and splashed on the floor. Everyone jumped, including Mr. Wormwood. What the heck's the matter with you, woman? He shouted. Look at the mess you've made on the carpet. There she is. She just dropped the breakfast. Your hair, the mother was shrieking, pointing a quivering finger at her husband. Look at your hair. What have you done to your hair? What's wrong with my hair, for heaven's sakes, he said. Oh my God, Dad, what have you done to your hair? The son shouted. A splendid, noisy scene was building up nicely in the breakfast room. Matilda said nothing. She simply sat there, admiring the wonderful effect of her handiwork. Mr. Wormwood, fine, fine black hair, was now dirty silver, the color this time of a tightrope walker's tight that had not been washed for an entire circus season. You... You, you, you've you dyed your hair, shrieked the mother. Why did you do that, you fool? You look absolutely frightful. It looks horrendous. You look like a freak. What in the blazes are you talking about, the father yelled, putting both hands on his hair. I most certainly have not dyed it. What do you mean I've dyed it? What's happened to it? Or is this some kind of stupid joke? He, His face was turning pale green and the color, the color of sour apples. You, you must have dyed it, Dad, the son said. It's the same color as mom's, only much dirtier looking. Of course he's dyed it, the mother said. It can't change color all by itself. What on earth were you trying to do? Make yourself look handsome or something? You look like someone's grandmother gone wrong. Give me the mirror, the father yelled. Don't just stand there shrieking at me. Give me a mirror. The mother's handbag lay on the chair at the other end of the table. She opened the bag and got out a powder compact that had a small round mirror on the inside of the lid. She opened the compact and handed it to her husband. She grabbed it and held it before his face, and in doing so, spilled most of the powder all over the front of his fancy tweed jacket. Be careful, shrieked the mother. Now look what you've done. That's my best Elizabeth Arden face powder. Oh my God, the father yelled. What has happened to me? I look terrible. I just look like you gone wrong. I can't go down to the garage and sell cars like this. How did this happen? He stared around the room, first at his mother, then at his son, then at Matilda. 
How could this have happened? He yelled. I imagine, Daddy, Matilda said quietly, that you weren't looking very hard and you simply took Mummy's bottle of hair stuff on the shelf instead of your own. There's Mr. Wormwood with Mrs. Wormwood's um, makeup compact looking at his new hairdo. Well, of course that's what happened, the mother said. Really, Harry, how stupid can you get? Why didn't you read the label before you started splashing that stuff all over you? Mine's terribly strong, only meant to use one tablespoon of it in the whole water basin, and you've gone and put it all over your head neat. It'll probably take all your hair off in the end. Your scalp is beginning to, is your scalp beginning to burn, dear? You mean I'm going to lose all my hair, the husband yelled. I think you will, the mother said. Perhaps it's a very powerful chemical. It's what they put down in the lavatory to disinfect the pan, only they give it another name. What are you saying, the husband cried. I'm not a lavatory pan. I don't want to be disinfected. Even diluted like I use it, the mother told him. It makes a great deal of my hair fall out. So goodness knows what's going to happen to you. I'm surprised it didn't take off the whole top of your head. What shall I do, wailed the father. Tell me quick before it all starts falling out. Matilda said, I'd give it a good wash, Dad, if I were you with soap and water. But you'll have to hurry. Will it change back to the color black? The father said anxiously. Of course it won't, you twit, the mother said. Then what do I do? I can't go looking around like this forever. You'll have to have it dyed black, the mother said. But... But wash it first or there won't be anything left to dye. Right, the father shouted, springing into action. Give me a point with your hairdresser this instant for a hair dyeing job. Tell them it's an emergency. they got to boot someone else off their list. I'm going to go upstairs and wash it now. With the man dashed out of the room and Mrs. Wormwood sighed deeply and went to the telephone to call the beauty parlor. He does some pretty silly things now and again, doesn't he, mummy? Matilda said. The mother dialing the number on the phone said, I'm afraid men are not quite as clever as we think they are. You will learn that when you get a little bit older, my girl. This chapter is called Miss Honey. Matilda was a little late in starting school. Most children begin primary school at five or even just before, but Matilda's parents, who weren't very concerned one way or another about their daughter's education, had forgotten to make the proper arrangements in advance. She was five and a half when she entered school for the first time. The village school for younger children was bleak brick building called the Crunchham Hall Primary School. It had about 250 pupils aged from 5 to just under 12 years old. The head teacher, the boss, the supreme commander of this establishment was a formidable middle-aged lady whose name was Miss Trenchable. Naturally, Matilda was put in the bottom class. There were 18 other small boys and girls about the same age as her. Their teacher was called Miss Honey. She could not have been more than 23 or 24. She had a lovely pale oval Madonna face with blue eyes and her hair was light brown. Her body was so slim and fragile, a fragile one got a feeling that if she fell over, she would smash into a thousand pieces like a porcelain figure. Miss Jennifer Honey was a mild and quiet person who never raised her voice and was seldom seen to smile. But there is no doubt that she possessed that rare gift to be adored by every small child in her care. She seemed to really understand the bewilderment and fear that so often overwhelms young children for the first time in their lives that when they are hurried into the classroom and they are told to obey orders. Some curious warmth that was almost tangible shone out of Miss Honey's face when she spoke a confused to a confused and homesick newcomer to the class. Miss Trenchbull, the headmistress, was something else altogether. She was a gigantic holy terror, a fierce, tyrannical monster who frightened the life out of pupils and teachers alike. There was an aura of menace around her, even at a distance, and when she came up close, you could almost feel the dangerous heat radiating from her from a hot red, from a hot red rod of metal. When she marched, Miss Trenchbull never walked. She marched like a stormtrooper with long strides and arms a-swinging. When she marched along the corridor, you could actually hear her snorting when she went. And if a group of children happened to be in her path, she piled right on through them like a tank, with a small people bouncing off of her left and right. Thank goodness we don't meet many people like her in the world, although they do exist, and all of us are likely to come across at least one of them in a lifetime. If you ever do, you should behave yourself if, if you had met an enraged rhinoceros with out in the bush. Climb up to the nearest tree, stay there until it has gone away. This woman, in all her eccentricities and in her appearance, is almost impossible to describe, but I shall make some attempts to do so a little later on. Let's leave her for the moment and go back to Matilda in her first day in Miss Honey's class. 
After the usual business of going through all the names of the children, Miss Honey hand out a brand new exercise book to each pupil. Well, I hope you have all brought your own pencil, I hope, she said. Yes, Miss Honey, they chanted. Good. Now the very first day of school for each one of you. It is the beginning of at, le at least 11 long years of schooling that all of you are going to have to go through. And six of those years will be spent right here in Crencham Hall, where, as you know, your head mistress is Miss Trunchbull. Let me, for your own good, tell you something about Miss Trunchbull. She insists on being strict discipline throughout the school, and if you take my advice, you will do your very best to behave yourself in her presence. Never argue with her. Never answer back. Always do what she says. If you get on the wrong side of Miss Trunchbull, she can liquidize you into like a carrot in a kitchen blender. It's nothing to laugh about, Lavender. Take that grin off your face. All of you will be wise to remember that Miss Trunchbull deals with it very, very severely. And if anyone gets out of line in this school, have you got that message? Yes, Miss Honey, chirped 18 eager little voices. I myself, Miss Honey went on, want to help you learn as much as possible while you're in this class. That is because I know you'll make it'll make things easier for you later on. For example, by the end of this week, I shall expect every one of you to know your two times table by heart. And in a year's time, I hope you all know all the multiplication tables up to 12. It will help you enormously if you do. Now then, do any of you have any learned any two times table already? Matilda put up her hand. She was the only one. Miss Honey looked carefully at the tiny girl with the dark hair and the round, serious face sitting at the second row. Wonderful, she said. Please stand up and recite as much as you can. Matilda stood up and began saying the two times table. When she got to... When she got to twice 12 is 24, she didn't stop. She went right on to twice 13 is 26, twice 14 is 28, twice 15 is 30, twice 16 is... Stop, Miss Honey said. She had been listening slightly spellbound with a smooth recital and now said, How far can you go? How far? Matilda said. Well, I really don't know, Miss Honey. For quite a long time, I think. Miss Honey took a few minutes to let this curious statement sink in. You mean, she said, that you could tell me what 2 times 28 is? Yes, Miss Honey. What is it? 56, Miss Honey. What about something much harder, like 2 times 487? Could you tell me that? I think so, said Matilda. Are you sure? Why, yes, Miss Honey, I'm fairly sure. What is it, then? 2 times 478. 974, Matilda said immediately. She spoke quietly and politely without any signs of showing off. Miss Honey gazed at Matilda with absolute amazement, but when she spoke to keep her voice level. That is really splendid, she said. But of course, multiplying by two is a lot easier than some bigger numbers. What about those multiplication tables? Do you know any of those? So this is in Miss Honey's class. She just asked if they know the two times table, which all of you guys know that one. I think so, Miss Honey. I think I can do it. Which ones, Matilda, have you gotten so far? I don't quite know, Matilda said. I don't know what you mean. What I mean is for you, for instance, know the three times table. Yes, Miss Honey. And the fours time? Yes, Miss Honey. Well, how many do you know, Matilda? Do you know all the times table up to the twelfth? Yes, Miss Honey. What are twelve sevens then? Eighty-four, Matilda said. Miss Honey paused and leaned back in her chair behind the plain table that stood in the middle of the floor in the front of the class. She was considerably shaken by this exchange, but took care not to show it. She had never come across a five-year-old or indeed a 10 year old who can multiply with such facility. I hope you, the rest of you are listening to this, she said to the class. Matilda is a very lucky girl. She has wonderful parents who already taught her to multiply a lot of numbers. Was it your mother, Matilda, who taught you? No, Miss Honey, it wasn't. You must have a great father then. He must be a brilliant teacher. No, Miss Honey, Matilda said quietly. My father did not teach me. You mean you taught yourself? I don't quite know, Matilda said truthfully. It's just that I don't find it very difficult to multiply one number by another. Miss Honey took a deep breath and let out slowly. She looked again at the small girl with bright eyes standing beside the desk, so sensible and solemn. You say you don't find it difficult to multiply one number by another, Miss Honey said. Could you try to explain that a little bit? Oh, dear, Matilda said. I'm really not sure. Miss Honey waited. The class was silent, all listening. For instance, Miss Honey, if I ask you to multiply 14 by 19... No, that's too difficult. It's 266, Matilda said softly. Miss Honey stared at her. Then she picked up the pencil and quickly worked out the sum on the piece of paper. What did you say it was, she said, looking up. 
266, Matilda said. Miss Sunny put down her pencil and removed her spectacles and began to polish the lenses with a piece of tissue. The class remained quiet, watching her and waiting for what's to come next. Matilda was standing beside her desk. Now tell me, Matilda, Miss Honey said, going on polishing. Try to tell me exactly what goes on inside your head when you get to multiplication like that. You obviously have to work it out in some way, but you seem to arrive at the answer almost instantly. Take the one you've just done, 14 multiplied by 19. I, 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 sim I simply put the 14 down in my head and multiply it by 19, Matilda said. I'm afraid I don't know how else to explain it. I've always said to myself that, a li that if a... That if a little pocket calculator can do it, why shouldn't I? Why not indeed, Miss Honey said. The human brain is an amazing thing. I think it's a lot better than a lump of metal, Matilda said. That's all a calculator is. How right you are, Miss Honey said. Pocket calculators are not allowed in this school anyways. Miss Honey was feeling quite quivery. There was no doubt in her mind that she had made a truly extraordinary mathematical brain and words like child genius and prodigy were flitting through her head. She knew that these sorts of wonders do pop up in the world from time to time, but only once or twice in a hundred years. After all, Mozart was only five when he began composing for the piano, and look what happened to him. It's not fair, Lavender said. How can she do it and we can't? Don't worry, Lavender. You'll soon catch up, Miss Honey said, lying through her teeth. At this point, Miss Honey could not resist the temptation of exploring still further the mind the mind of this astonishing child. She knew she ought to pay, be paying some attention to the rest of the class, but she was altogether too excited to let the matter rest. Well, she said, pretending to adjust the whole class, let's us leave sums for a moment, moment and see what you have begun to learn for spelling. Hands up of anyone who can spell cats. Three hands went up. They belonged to Lavender, a small boy called Nigel, and to Matilda. Spell cat, Nigel. Nigel spelled it. Honey, Miss Honey now decided to ask a question that you normally not have dreamed of asking a class on the first day. I wonder, she said, whether if any of you three know how to spell cat, have learned to read the whole group of words when they are strung together in a sentence. I have, Nigel said. So have I, Lavender said. Miss Honey went to the blackboard and, and wrote with her white chalk the sentence. I have already begun to learn how to read long sentences. She had purposely made it difficult. She knew that there were few very few precious five-year-olds who would be able to manage that. Can you tell me what that says, Nigel, she asked. That's too hard, Nigel said. Lavender, the first word is I, Lavender said. Can any of you read this whole sentence? Miss Honey asked, waiting for the yes that she felt was certain was going to come from Matilda. Yes, Matilda said. Go ahead, Miss Honey. Matilda read the sentence without any hesitation. That is really good indeed, Miss Honey said, making the understatement of her life. How much can you read, Matilda? I think I can read most things, Miss Honey, Matilda said, although I'm afraid I can't always understand the meanings. Miss Honey got to her feet and walked smartly around the room, but she was back in about 30 seconds carrying thick books. She opened up to a random and placed a random page and placed it on Matilda's desk. This is a book of humorous poetry, and see if you can read that one aloud. Smoothly, without a pause, and at a nice speed, Matilda began to read. An epicure dining at the crew found a rather large mouse in a stew. Cried the waiter, don't shout, and wave it about, or we'll rest be wanting one too. Several children saw the funny side of the bread and laughed. Miss Honey said, do you know what Epicure is, Matilda? It's someone who is dainty with his eating, Matilda said. That is correct. How do you, and do you know what a particular type of poetry is called? This is called a limerick, Matilda said. That's a lovely one. It's so funny. It's a famous one, Miss Honey said, picking the book up and returning to the table in the front of the class. A witty limerick is hard to write, she added. They look easy, but they most certainly are not. I know, Matilda. I've tried quite a few times, but mine are never good. You have, have you? Miss Honey said, more than startled than ever. Well, Matilda, I very much like to hear one of those limericks you say you have written. Could you try to remember one for us? Well, Matilda said, hesitating. I've actually been trying to make one up about you, Miss Honey. While we've been sitting here, about me, Miss Honey cried. Well, we've certainly got to hear that one, haven't we? I don't think I want to say, Miss Honey. Please tell it, Miss Honey said. I promise I won't mind. I think you will, Miss Honey, because I have to use your first name to make things rhyme, and that's something I don't want to say. How do you know my first name, Miss Honey asked. I heard another teacher calling you by it just before we came in, Matilda said. She called you Jenny.
I insist upon hearing this limerick, Miss Honey said, smiling one of those rare smiles. Stand up and recite it. Reluctantly, Matilda stood up, and very slowly, very nervously, she recited her limerick. The thing we all ask about Jenny is surely there cannot be many. Young girls in the place with such a lovely face, the answer is not any. The whole of Miss Honey's pale and pleasant face blushed with a brilliant scarlet. Then once again she smiled. It was so much broader this time, a smile of pure pleasure. Why, thank you, Matilda, she said, still smiling. Although it is not true, it is really good to hear a good limerick. Oh dear, oh dear, I must try to remember that one. From the third row of the desk, Lavender said, It's good, I like it. It's true as well, a small boy called Rupert said. Of course it's true, Nigel said. Already the whole class had began to warm up towards Miss Honey, although she had yet hardly no taken any notice of anyone except Matilda. Who taught you to read, Matilda? Miss Honey asked. I sort of just taught myself, Miss Honey. And have you read any books all by yourself? Any children's books, I mean? I've read all the ones that are in the public library in the high street, Miss Honey. And do you like them? I like some of them very much indeed, Matilda said. But I thought others were fairly dull. Tell me about one you like. I like the line, the witch in the wardrobe, Matilda said. I think Mr. C.S. Lewis is a very good writer, but he has one feeling. There are no funny bits in his books. You are right there, Miss Honey said. There aren't very many funny bits in Mr. Tolkien's either, Matilda said. Do you think that all children's books ought to have funny bits in them? Miss Honey asked. I do, Matilda said. Children are not so serious as grown-ups, and they love to laugh. <laughs> Excuse me. Miss Honey was astounded by the wisdom of this tiny girl. She said, and what are you going to do now that you've read all the children's books? I'm reading other books, Matilda said. I borrowed them from the library. Mrs. Phelps is very kind to me. She helps me choose them sometimes. Miss Honey was leaning far forward over her work table and gazing in wonder at the child. She had completely forgotten now the rest of the class. What other books, she murmured. I'm very fond of Charles Dickens, Matilda said. He makes me laugh a lot, especially Mr. Pickwick. At that moment, the bell in, in the school sounded for the end of class. All right, that's all I have time for today. Have a great day. Bye.